Well, I, I, I want to say uh, here for the record, because I, I, know, I know you're interviewing me, I'm not interviewing you, I understand that, but <laughs> you're one of those people who's saying, how can we reinvent the internet? And that must be done. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another interview episode of the What Kind of Internet Do You Want series. Today, I'm chatting with Dr. Robert Epstein, an author, editor, and longtime psychology researcher and professor. He's a distinguished scientist, former editor-in-chief of Psychology Today, and is currently senior research psychologist at the American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology. And in July of 2019, he testified before Congress about his research into Google's surveillance, censorship, and manipulation of search results. We recorded this interview in November of 2019, and as you will hear, his work absolutely blows my mind. I already knew about these issues, and yet hearing some of the specific details get filled in with evidence from peer-reviewed, randomized studies was absolutely stunning. We spoke for such a long time, we split the interview into two parts. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I hope you do too. But before we dive in, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified about our videos. Thanks so much for supporting Freedom Online. One of my favorite things about learning all about Dr. Epstein's research is how incredible and um, I want to say like perfectionistic it is. It is peer reviewed, controlled, randomized studies. His research is just unimpeachable for lack of a better word. And um, the results are just mind bending when you look at the nuance and complexity and different ways that the suppression and censorship and surveillance are happening. Um, so he has an incredible um, history too. Dr. Epstein has a PhD from Harvard. He was the editor in chief of psychology today. He's written 15 books and is the father of five. And most recently he's become known for his Google research and how they are surveilling us, censoring things, and manipulating us. And so I am very pleased to welcome to the show, Dr. Robert Epstein. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Amy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. So um, I have noticed that so far you've really only been able to be interviewed by a lot of conservative outlets. And I even saw in your article in the New York Times that you expressed frustration about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not a conservative, so it's, uh, it's, it is frustrating, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of strange that that's been who has been willing to tell your story. Um, and, you know, my first job was for the Democratic Party. So uh, I guess this is your first non-conservative um, host <laughs> uh, interview. I think that's uh, probably true, but although I've published in kind of all the mainstream publications, so... Uh, uh, one of my first publications about Google was in Huffington Post, and then I published in Time Magazine. I That's published right. yeah. multiple articles in U.S. News and World Report. Um, so I've, I've, I've published everywhere, but it's true. Uh, when it comes to interviews, uh, it's mainly conservatives uh, who are anxious to talk to me, and that's, that's, that does uh, bother me, and the problems I've been looking into uh, should be of concern to everybody, uh, everyone in the world, really, um, and not just conservatives in the United States. That's right, regardless of affiliation, because these are really human issues that affect our, our minds and what we think about the world around us. And it's been pretty disappointing to me to see that you haven't been, because your research is just astonishing. It really, really is. I mean, so from what I understand, you've done three different major studies. Is that correct? One in 2016, the one in India, and the one in 2018? Well, I think I've gone public with um, – it's hard to count them, really, but I, I've gone public with research I've done on what I call the search engine manipulation effect, uh, another effect called the search suggestion effect, um, but at scientific conferences, um, I've actually, uh, which is, you know, a little more uh, hard to find, but I, I've actually uh, presented dozens of, of studies. Uh, altogether, I've discovered roughly a dozen new forms of influence that the internet has made possible. 
I'm currently in the process of uh, trying to understand and quantify seven of them. Uh, so I've had to name them literally mm -hmm. as I've discovered them because mm -hmm. these new forms of influence have been made possible by the internet, have never existed before in human history. And unfortunately, they're almost entirely in the hands of, of two American companies uh, that's especially disturbing. So the fact that there are new forms of influence, that they're extremely powerful, uh, generally that people can't see them, that's disturbing. But even more disturbing is that these new forms of influence are in the hands mainly of two American companies. And if they use these techniques, no one can counteract them. So we, we really have a problem. It's a very serious problem. It, it's a, a gigantic problem. It's a mind-bending problem, too, when you really start pulling it apart and diving into the details of your research. The new censorship article that you wrote in U.S. News & World Report really blew my mind. There were so many astonishing stories. I keep using the word astonishing because it's just incredible what your work has revealed. Um, and I mentioned your background in particular because I think that you were uniquely positioned to be able to see what's been happening um, because of your, your other kinds of research that you've done, because you were, I think you said, one of the last students that worked um, under uh, B.F. Skinner. Yes, so uh, you really understand the power sure. of influence that way. What is that? So um, his theory of operant conditioning, the idea that behavior is determined by consequences, be they reinforcements or punishments, which make it more or less likely that the behavior will occur again. And so I was just thinking that putting together that kind of side of your work, then looking at tech, because you've also been a programmer since you were 13 years old, is that right? Yeah, roughly, yes. <laughs> it's, you were just like the, one of the only people who'd be able to see all the different sides of that puzzle. And you saw it so much earlier than most people did too, right? Your first um, impulse or your first idea that something was wrong was in 2012. That's, that's so much. Was anybody else able to think about that with you at that time? There were a couple of people. In fact, I've since have, have become friends with them. Um, way back in uh, uh, 2006, 2007, uh, a very prominent uh, legal scholar, uh, Frank uh, Pasquale, uh, who's at now, I think, at the University of Maryland, he actually published with a colleague a long article in a, in a legal journal, a law journal, calling for Google's regulation. Really? Uh, back Way back then, um, a man uh, named uh, Scott Cleland uh, testified before Congress. Uh, he had worked in the first Bush administration, uh, calling for Google's regulation. And then in 2011, um, before I even was thinking seriously about the Google problem, uh, Cleland published a book called Search and Destroy, <laughs> which was about uh, Google's ability uh, to uh, to manipulate and to surveil and so on. And, uh, and he basically, uh, he pointed out that uh, Google presents a very serious threat to humankind. So uh, at that point, no one had done actual scientific research to explore these issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but it wasn't until 2012 that I finally got interested and, and, and tried to see what I could do using, again, methods of uh, scientific research to try to understand uh, what power um, Google and other companies have uh, to um, to manipulate people's thinking and behavior. Uh, so there were people before me, but very few. <laughs> they weren't taken seriously. And when I started uh, doing my own research, um, I wasn't taken very seriously either. I'm sure. Um, when I went public with the results of my earliest experiments, which was in um, spring of 2013, the Washington Post did actually run a story uh, about my early experiments, and, and they raised the question, uh, could Google actually shift an election uh, if they use these powers that my wow. experiments uh, demonstrated. Uh, so that's when things started to take off. But um, it's only very, very recently, um, really in the last year, this mm -hmm. is now late 2019, mm -hmm. uh, that really um, 
you know, that a lot of people have, have, have started to understand just how big a problem this is. Uh, so I was That's early, so but, but not the first. So tell us about those first experiments that you did. Kind of walk us through your, how you did them and then some of those findings. Sure. In 2012, um, I started to get interested in Google because Google notified me that my website had been hacked. And I got curious about that because I wondered why was Google notifying me? Mm -hmm. Why not some uh, nonprofit organization? Why not a government agency? I mean, who made Google the sheriff of the internet, in right. fact? And the answer to that is, by the way, they made themselves. I was going to say, self-appointed, They, they right? were self-appointed. Yeah. Right? No one ever made them the sheriff. Uh, so uh, I started uh, at some point noticing that there was a growing literature uh, in the marketing field about the power that search results have to sell products basically by getting clicks uh, and it turns out that uh, if you could just move uh, you know your uh, your entry in Google search results if you could move it up a notch or two in search results uh, that could make you a fortune they mm -hmm. could make a difference between success or failure in a business um, so I asked a question it was just a question at the time uh, if, if people are that impressed by high-ranking search results could we use high-ranking search results to shift people's opinions, opinions, maybe even shift their voting preferences? So early 2013, I conducted my first experiments on what came to be called SEME, S-E-M-E, the search engine manipulation effect. Um, I thought that if I favored one candidate or another in search results, and by that I mean simply that if you click on a high-ranking search result, it would take you to a web page that would make that candidate look much look better good. than his or her opponent. Mm -hmm. um, so I simply raised the question, if, if one candidate were favored in Google search results, um, what percentage of undecided voters might shift their opinions uh, and start to think, hey, that's, that's definitely the better candidate. Uh, I predicted that probably the, I could get a shift of 2 or 3% of my undecided voters uh, shifting in the direction of the favored candidate. Uh, first experiment I ever ran, I got a shift of 48%. And I thought, that's impossible. So, and for people who haven't heard about this before, I heard you talk about list effects. And that, I mean, it's pretty obvious, the idea of a list effect. As soon as I heard you talking about it, I was like, oh yeah, things at the top of a list are easier to remember. Um, but it's not something I personally ever thought about before. I don't have a background in psychology. And so, you know, you said list effects have been studied for hundreds of years, or maybe hundreds, hundred years. Um, but that this kind of a list is more powerful, maybe. Oh, this, it turns out, is a very unusual kind of list. Yeah. And it took me uh, years of research to really understand uh, why being at the top or near the top of Google search results, which is just a list, why that has so much power, why this list effect is very different from all the others that have been studied for, as you say, 100 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, second experiment I ran, I got a shift of 63%. Um, and, and I began to notice something else, too, that people could not see, generally speaking, that they were looking at a biased list. And I thought, well, that's, that's weird, because that meant that possibly, maybe, if you introduce bias or favoritism in Google search results, Maybe, I thought, you could not only shift the opinions and voting preferences of a lot of people, but maybe you could do it in a way that's invisible to people. Right. And so I kept running experiments. Um, at some point in 2013, I ran a national study with more than uh, 2,000 participants in all 50 states. Uh, and again, got very, very uh, large uh, shifts. But... More importantly, uh, I was able to find out that, indeed, you could change people's opinions about candidates, change their voting preferences, without anyone knowing mm -hmm. that this is occurring. Uh, in that big study, I found out something else, which is the very small number of people who could see bias in this search part, results. This part fascinates yeah. me. Yeah. 
they shift even farther in the direction of, of the, the bias. bias. That's so confusing. Well, we uh, eventually did experiments just on that issue to try to understand what was happening. Uh, but basically, there are two reasons for it. One is uh, people are uh, people believe, as in, you know, which is which is unfortunate. But people believe that uh, computer output is inherently impartial and mm-hmm. objective because mm-hmm. it's coming from a computer. And of course, that's complete nonsense because computers are programmed by people and people biases are reflected in computer programs. But generally, people don't know about such things. They don't know what a computer program is. They don't uh, understand where that output is coming from. So people are very trusting of computer output. That's the first thing. But it turns out there's another factor uh, here, uh, which is that people are being trained Uh, condition, Skinner would have said, Mm -hmm. every single day to trust high-ranking search results because most of the searches that we conduct are for simple facts, like what is the capital of California? I put math problems into Google sometimes that I don't want to do in my head, and it just does the calculation for me, right? Of course. And and when when you're looking for a simple fact, like, you know, know, what is 63 times 22? (laughs) Uh, invariably, inevitably, always, the correct answer ends up at the top of the list. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, we're being conditioned like rats in a Skinner box every single day to believe that what's at the top is best, what's at the top is true. Mm-hmm. And uh, I actually conducted experiments on that issue uh, to break people's belief in that. If you break people's belief in that by putting the best answers over and over again down lower in the list, uh, then they're less affected by the bias Interesting. Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a bias sure. list of search results sure. that favors one candidate. Because when Google was putting the ads right at the top, people got accustomed to maybe scrolling past that and looking a little bit lower on the list to look for what they were looking for. So sure. that, I've, yeah, I've absolutely had that experience. And I, as you were talking, so I watched the creepy line, of course, in preparation for this interview. And I just have to say, everyone, it is fantastic. It's a must watch because it not only explains so much about these concepts in a really easy to understand way, but it also is illuminating things that we're just not even thinking about. And so I think that most people have an idea that if you rank higher on Google, it's because more other pages link to you. That's how Google became number one, or at least that's what it says in the creepy line. And I had that sense about Google that that's how they were ranking their results. And so it was more of a popularity contest of authority than anything else, I guess, and then kind of a game that people would play for that authority. But what what you're now looking at is what else are they doing in order to change that ranking? Because it's no longer what it was when they began first getting popular with that method. They're, they're changing those rankings in other ways now. Is that right? Well, I think a lot of the tools that we use online, um, Google's tools and tools of other companies, I think they often start out as pretty innocent kinds of tools. Sure. So uh, at some point, uh, Google introduced what they called um, autocomplete. Uh, and at first, um, uh, all it was was a way of, of speeding up your, your search process because you start to type a search term and Google flashes suggestions at you. And uh, in the early days, uh, uh, that was kind of a, an opt-in feature. Then you could no longer opt out of it at some point. Uh, in the early days, they would show you 10 uh, suggestions, which to, to this day, I think Yahoo and Bing pretty much do as well. And the implication of these suggestions is that they're the most frequently searched for phrases that would go along with what you're typing. Well, right? the, Google would claim that they're the most <laughs> frequently searched for phrases, but it probably more and more they were, they, were t- they were actually reflective of your personal history, the, the information Google had about you, where they're trying to anticipate what it is you're, you personally are searching for. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. But over time, it turned into something else. It turned, it turned into a tool for manipulation. And so for, uh, for a number of years, they were only showing you four search suggestions 
On mobile devices, they still tend to show you five. Well, it turns out that, as I showed in experiments, if they're just showing you four or five, that is the optimal number of suggestions they can show someone in order to manipulate what you're going to search for. Uh, is there a reason behind that? It's just sort of how our brains work. It's like a, a number that I can sort of remember all of them, or it's easily digestible or something like that, whereas eight, it's like a lot of choices. Is that what it is? Well, uh, it's it's a little it's it's a mathematical phenomenon, but okay. basically what it what it means is that uh, the easiest way they can get you to click on something is by uh, putting a negative item into a list of neutral and positive items, so that it stands out. So it, it stands out, and that's in the, and that's the one they want me to click on when they oh, do that. Oh, definitely. If they allow a negative in that list, and they want you to click on it. In fact, a negative in a list of neutrals and positive will draw 10 to 15 times as many clicks, generally speaking. Uh, this is called, in the social sciences, called negativity bias, sometimes called the cockroach, cockroach in the salad, the salad. phenomenon. I, I love that, that um, um, analogy because it's so clear. No one would want to eat a, a, a salad with a cockroach in it. It draws all of your attention, right? And it's the same idea here. Like, oh, what is that? I, I don't even care what I was looking for. Now I need to know what that, that terrible suggestion is saying. Exactly. Negatives draw attention. And, and that's been known and studied in multiple fields for a long time. So it turns out that if your list is too long, that is diluting the impact of the negative item. Ah. And if your list is too short, then that unfortunately means the person might continue to type his or her own search suggestion because <laughs> you're not giving them enough options. You can't have that. So that 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 median point, the point at which, uh, you know, putting a negative in a list has, a, has its biggest impact happens to be four items. Uh, you can get away with five. The point is, for a long time, Google was, was there's no question, this is turned into a tool for manipulation, and their search suggestions still are a tool, very powerful tool for manipulation. Yeah. Um, and I've shown in experiments that uh, just by manipulating search suggestions that I'm kind of tossing at people, I can turn a 50-50 split among undecided voters into a 90-10 split with no one having the slightest idea that they have been manipulated. So I think a lot of tools, including the search results, the search suggestions, the answer box, mm -hmm. news feeds, mm -hmm. and so on. So I wrote down all of these um, different effects that you've defined. The search engine manipulation effect, the search suggestion effect, and that's the one with the four options, right? The targeted messaging effect, mm -hmm. opinion matching effect, answer bot effect, shadow banning, programmed virality, and the digital bandwagon effect, the Facebook effect, censorship, pretty broad one, we'll get into that one more, and the digital customization effect. And um, what you were talking about, about how we kind of, um, by, by being, getting information that reinforces what we already want, because they have this whole um, profile of us, would that go on the program virality and digital bandwagon effect, or would that go on one of the other ones? Well, generally speaking, the more the company knows about you, the easier it is for the company to manipulate. Yeah. So that goes under the last one, digital customization. Oh, okay. That so if you, if you customize, if you personalize, and again, we've shown this in experiments too, we're trying to understand it better, uh, you, you basically have more power to control people. So the three big problems, which you mentioned earlier, one is surveillance, right. second is censorship, Right. And the third is manipulation. Those three big problems are kind of connected to each other because surveillance gives uh, those companies more information about you. And the more they know, the easier it is for them to manipulate you. Now, Google has not hidden the fact that they collect information. Uh, I mean, they don't want, want it very conscious in people's minds. As they, sure, you know, but as we're all vaguely aware of yeah, it, yeah. right? Oh, whatever, it's free. So, you know... But Google... Uh, I don't have anything to hide. What does it matter? Right. And Google <laughs> officially justifies this by saying, well, this allows us to customize what we show you and serve your needs better. That's, right. the, way they, that's the way they put it. They can, they can serve your needs better. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out they can also predict 
your needs better, and that they've also stated publicly. They can predict what you need and what you want, uh, and therefore uh, hook you up with with vendors, which is how advertisers. they advertisers. How they make their money. It all comes from advertising, right? Uh, but they can also predict what you're going to do, where you're going to go, uh, who you're going to vote for, whether you're going to vote or not. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it turns out the more you know about someone, the easier it is to manipulate them. That makes sense. That totally makes sense. Sure. Yeah. So let's talk about Google censorship in more detail. What, um, what is the aspects that you're most concerned with? Well, the big issue uh, is, is pretty simple, which is... Um, why should a single company, or call it two if you want, but why should a single company based in one country have the ability to decide uh, what two and a half billion people around the world can or cannot see? Now, uh, Google not only uh, has that power, that's, that's called the power of filtering, mm -hmm. it also has the power of ordering, mm -hmm. to decide what order the information will, will appear in. Why should one company have that ability? It's like, it would be like saying, uh, all the news in the world is gonna be delivered to everyone by Fox News. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Fox News is gonna decide what stories balance, yeah, but, people hey. can see, what they can't yeah. see, and the order in which they present the news stories. Uh, of course, everyone would agree that that's absolutely absurd, even if they're Fox News fans. Uh, again, substitute, the New York Times, the point right. is any, any one power of whether it's a government or it's a private company, you know, do we want that power to be in the hands of basically one entity? And, and of course the answer is no, but when it comes to search worldwide, uh, Google controls 92% of search. Uh, and the next largest uh, search provider, which is Bing, uh, draws about two and a half percent of search uh, worldwide. And after that, all the other little search engines draw less than one percent of search. In, in your article in U.S. News and World Report, you say that Google indexes more than 45 billion web pages and that its next biggest competitor, Microsoft's Bing, indexes only 14 billion. So I think Google would say, well, we're just better. So that's why we're dominating, right? <laughs> well, uh, Better or not better, uh, you know, we, we still have to ask that big question. Do, right. we, do we want that company with the, with the biggest index, and their index, by the way, is much, much larger than that now, uh, to have that kind of power? So um, just a few months ago, uh, this was a day before I testified before Congress uh, about Google, uh, I published an article in Bloomberg Business Week mm -hmm. uh, explaining a relatively simple uh, and quick way uh, to end Google's uh, worldwide monopoly on search, and that is to make their index, which is the database they use to generate search results, basically to make it public, uh, to make it accessible to everyone. Uh, there's precedent for this in Google's business practices. They, they actually do allow a couple of companies access to their index. One is mm -hmm. Apple, for example, which gets all its uh, answers on Siri, uh, from Google. Mm -hmm. um, then there's a small uh, search company called Start Page, which I recommend to everyone. It's all I use for search. Uh, Startpage.com uh, pulls its search results from Google's index, but you know decides on its own ordering rules, and it doesn't track you. So it doesn't it doesn't engage in surveillance the way. So it's Google not does. giving you those customized results in the right. way that Google is. If you search for something on Start Page and if I search for something on Start Page, we're going to get the same results. Exactly. So Start Page is 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 not trying to manipulate you, um, and they're not trying to uh, surveil you. Mm -hmm. uh, they just give you excellent quality results. The point is, what I said in this article is that if uh, Google were required, or if it voluntarily uh, made its index uh, public, then you'd end up with, over a period of months or a year or two, you'd end up with thousands of search platforms, mm -hmm. just like we have thousands of newspapers and radio stations, TV stations. You'd be taking the kind of environment we have in media and in news media, and you'd be creating that same environment in the search arena. Search would become highly competitive. 
uh, it's true, all of these different entities, all these search platforms would be drawing from the same index, but that's true with new services too. They're all drawing on the same set of facts, mm -hmm. uh, whatever happened that day, mm -hmm. and then they decide how they're going to present it, and they mm -hmm. decide on the ordering, whether they're going to suppress some stories. So you'd end up with, with, and, and with really a very healthy and competitive env environment of search, in which just a lot of competition, a lot of innovation. Yeah. Uh, it would be a wonderful thing. There's been no innovation in search now for almost 20 years. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like what you're saying, the antidote to the problem is competition. And that the way that we get competition is by uncoupling the search algorithm from the index itself. Because the search algorithm probably should be competitive because maybe I want customized results, right? Or I like the way that the UI of one looks more than another one or whatever that might be. But that, there, that because there are multiple options, that censorship, if, if one was engaging in censorship, it, it would be revealed by the market and the, and the competition forces. You'd see it on one platform and not on another. Well, that's exactly what happens, again, in news media. Uh, they're all making different decisions about filtering and ordering. Mm -hmm. You'd have thousands of search platforms all making different decisions about filtering and ordering and all catering to different audiences uh, mm -hmm. and all drawing the attention of different audiences. I mean, it's, it's, the more I've thought about this, the more excited I've been by this. It's, it's really what we should have in, in the area of search. Uh, because again, the innovations uh, would just be nonstop, different business models, different ways of presenting uh, you know, uh, the content of the internet uh, to our eyes. I think you said in that article that the 1956 consent decree with AT&T was also kind of precedent for doing something like this by opening up a bunch of the patents that they had. Um, there was um, an outpouring of innovation that came from that. Is, is that right? That's exactly right. And that was a, a consent decree worked out by our Department of Justice with AT&T. And they were, under that decree, they were required to share all of their patents oh. uh, for free with everyone in the world. And, and it led to an explosion of innovation in electronics and communications. Uh, we would find that same explosion of innovation in the area of search uh, if, if this particular uh, proposal uh, is adopted or enacted. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's not impossible because our Congress could do it, uh, our Department of Justice could do it, our Federal Trade Commission, or the European Union uh, could do this as well. So it's, it's not out of the question. It's even possible that Google could, uh, voluntarily could, do, it. could do this voluntarily. Uh, and they're, 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 that's not a crazy idea, by the way. Uh, it could be that as an alternative to other bad things that might happen to the company, they might say, hey, we mm -hmm. have a great idea, you know. Mm -hmm. And in effect, they would be giving up their monopoly on search. They could still make tons of money. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I think there, there, there are ways to solve some of the huge problems that we face with, with you know, with, uh, with tech. Uh, we just have to try to be creative. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things that's so interesting about this idea, too, is that um, in the leaked video, some of the ones with Project Veritas, the Google, um, the woman that was talking was saying, you know, breaking up Google would be the worst thing that could happen. Um, and that it's funny when we talk about separating the search engine from the index, because if they were to break up Google and force the index to fracture, that could be even more dangerous in some ways. Oh, that would be horrible. So you, you, can't, you can't break up the index. In other words, you, you can't break up, uh, in effect, the Google search engine. You can't break that up uh, because you'd end up with very poor quality results for everybody. That and you would not be able to find what was being censored or suppressed because it would be so fractured, you wouldn't, there wouldn't be a complete list to check against, I and guess. That, that right? would be a mess. And unfortunately, right. these proposals I've seen for, quote unquote, breaking up Google and Facebook, they don't, they're made by people like Senator Warren, who don't really understand, uh, you know, the, the tech. Uh, they don't understand mm -hmm. what the consequences would be. They don't understand, you can't break up Facebook's basic social networking platform. That's like, building a, a Berlin wall that would run around the world. And <laughs> That's a great analogy. It's so true. Dividing a family yeah. and friends. <laughs> and you can't break up Google's search engine. Right. You can make their index public, mm -hmm. however. Because the network's effects of certain things 
are positive in that way. Sure. You know, the more of us are connected on Facebook, the more of us are connected in general. It's just we need to have these different pieces of tech come in to fill the gaps that, you know, have resulted, whether it be malicious or negligence, it, it's happening, right? Exactly. Yeah. So um, before we bring Zach in, I just want to talk a little bit more about the blacklists that you have identified. So you've identified 10 of these as well. And those are the autocomplete blacklist, the Google Maps blacklist, the YouTube blacklist, Google account blacklist, Google News blacklist, Google AdWords blacklist, Google AdSense blacklist, the search engine blacklist, the quarantine list, and there's a little postscript about the shopping service blacklist, which I really appreciated the quote you included here, that they can ban the sale of any product or service its employees deem to be offensive or inappropriate. So it's very clear that these blacklists have a lot of subjectivity that goes into them. Even if the uh, act of being put on the blacklist is automated by some sort of algorithm, the algorithm was written by a person, right? And that's how that happens. Well, also the algorithms, uh, all of these uh, blacklisting algorithms, they, they flag material that needs to be looked at by humans. Uh, and I have, uh, among my little treasures, I have a, a copy um, uh, of, a, of a training manual that's used to train um, screeners, human screeners uh, uh, at Google, uh, to make those those decisions about really? yes, that's fascinating. I and bet it is. There's a again, there's a lot of subjectivity involved, uh, but you know, a lot of a lot of material that is blacklisted by Google is is blacklisted because an algorithm flags material, and then and then humans look at the material and make a decision. And as I say, I actually have a training manual. Uh, that's used in, inside Google to train people uh, and how and what criteria they should use for making those decisions. So blacklisting is is a form of manipulation or can be used for manipulation. Um, when I testified before uh, Congress, which was July of uh, 2019, um, just before me, a high-ranking representative of Google was asked under oath by a senator. Uh, do you have blacklists? Mm -hmm. And this man said under oath, no, Senator, we do not. Now, this, this is, that's, really? that's, that's not just a lie. In that setting, that's perjury. And I, first, I wondered if they denied it outright like that or if they just skated around it by saying, we don't interfere in individual search results or whatever oh, no, no, that no, no. phrase was. No, they he, outright denied it? Outright denied it, and they have in the past as well. And That's this, astonishing because... One of the things I hate most about working in this field is that I have to talk about child pornography a lot because anybody that works in tech knows that that's something that's out there. And so if you are doing something like, say, building an open index, something you have to think about, it's almost always the first question I get when I present it to technical audiences. Sure. How are we going to deal with that? So anyone that's remotely technical knows that Google is running some kind of blacklist so that we're not getting that stuff when we Google search for things. Well, of course they're running blacklists. They always have. That's why I wrote about so many blacklists back in 2016, even though I'd never seen them. And so, uh, you know, blacklisting is a very simple way to, to manipulate. It's obvious and necessary for certain kinds of content, but then it's, it's where that line goes past that that gets into this part that we're having. Well, there, there are a lot of issues. One is, is the transparency issue. Mm -hmm. In other words, what's the process? It, 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 Google has always been a closely held secret. Mm -hmm. And to this day, they've denied having blacklists, which is absurd <laughs> now that we have whistleblowers who have actually shown us blacklists. And we're going to talk about that and, coming uh, up here. And not just from Google now, because now we've had the release of, of one of the internal blacklists from Pinterest. That's right. That's now out there. Right. And one of the things that Pinterest has been doing is um, putting things that maybe don't match kind of onto a blacklist. Is that right? Is that how you would say it? Like they have a blacklist for, let's say, child pornography, and they put um, websites, something that they don't want to show into it, like an abortion website. 
or or, like or even just a political website. A political or, website. In fact, it, one of the simplest ways to bury something is you've got your big pornography blacklist and you just take whatever else it is you want to get rid of and just throw it into your por pornography mm -hmm. blacklist. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, blacklists are kind of scary things. The lack of transparency, though, that's the main issue. Yes, you probably have to shield some users from some content. Newspapers do it, television stations do it, etc. But to have that process be ultra secret mm -hmm. and to have that process even be so secret that you deny it even exists, mm -hmm. that's very dangerous. And then again, if you've got, again, a company like Google, that is impacting billions of people around the world. This is getting this is getting crazy. This is this is scarier than you know any of the dystopian novels uh, ever written. Yeah. Oh, and, on that note, mm -hmm. in one of your articles, you mentioned that Google turned off the internet for forty minutes. Oh yes. yes Speaking yes. of dystopian stories, right? Or well, classic the, stories. That's right. The biggest blacklist that I mentioned in that article. Internally, they call their quarantine list. Mm -hmm. uh, um, people have just no concept that it even exists. It's but like purgatory. Google, You're just there indefinitely, kind of. Well, Google can, can cut off people's access to a website. And it turns out, at one point, they acknowledged every single day, this was a few years ago, adding at least 9,000 websites to this list. Uh, it is believed to contain several million websites uh, and, you know, we don't think of Google as blocking access to websites, mm -mm. but they do. So not long ago, some error was made somewhere and they blocked access to almost every website in Japan for 10 or 11 minutes. There was a day indeed in 2009 where they blocked access to virtually the entire Internet for 40 minutes. I didn't know this. Yeah. I and that they acknowledged. That was because it was reported by The Guardian. They acknowledged that it occurred. They said it was just some sort of error. But eventually I figured out why they chose those 40 minutes. That's what was bugging me. Because I know... Um, you no know, way does something like that happen just accidentally and oh, for no, no, 40 minutes. No, this was not accidental. And, and, and as your, your next guest, I'm sure, will confirm, there's a lot of mischievousness uh, among uh, coders. That's, I've been a coder almost my whole life, and yes. there's a lot of mischievousness among coders. Uh, and I finally uh, came up with, a, 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 I think, a solid theory uh, about why they chose those 40 minutes. It turns out that that's one of the only blocks of time in the entire week when all of the stock markets in the world simultaneously are closed. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you could, you, could, you could block access to the internet without causing chaos in financial markets just by shutting off it off during that period of time. So it's, it's genius, uh, it's funny, and it's also Frightening. Frightening. Right. Yeah. That that company has that power, that they exercise that power every day. In, in other words, they made themselves the sheriff of the internet. Mm -hmm. And no one has a clue that this is occurring. No one is taking any steps to limit their power. Um, awareness finally is growing. So mm -hmm. that's the only good news. And mm -hmm. Another kind of thing has happened, which is crazy. Now we have real whistleblowers coming forward, mm -hmm. sometimes walking away with documents or videos, and we are getting more and more glimpses of what's happening on the inside of this highly, highly secretive and obscenely powerful company. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's kind of the growing um, urgency of the problem just in terms of all of us, and that's also then showing out through these interviews, through the whistleblowers, through all of that. Because I think, you know, my mom will often be like, oh, I don't know what you do, and, and I don't care, you know, uh, boring tech. But then she'll also call me and complain that Facebook is listening to her because she was talking to her friend, and then right. she saw an ad for that thing that she was talking about, or whatever it is, you know? And so it's like, well, see, there are real issues here that are impacting all of us on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that, like you said, public awareness is growing even for people who don't even really understand or care about these things, they're starting that, that creepy line has been crossed. And so people are now starting to feel creeped out, I think. So it's an exciting time, I think, you know, to be in this and to see how things are going to change because the internet is 
a wonderful place. It's such a wonderful place and such a wonderful tool. And yet it's become a little bit of a monster right now. Well, I, I, I want to say uh, here for the record, because I, I, know, I know you're interviewing me, I'm not interviewing you, I understand that, but, uh, you know, that, that your work is, you know, is also provides a glimpse of a better future for the internet, because there are, there are some alternatives out there. Uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web, um, you know, he's out there too. He's, you know, you and Sir Tim Berners-Lee and other people uh, yeah, out there absolutely. are basically saying- We're building hey, specifications yeah. for the future. And, and Sir Tim is building, sure. we, we like to say that they're like um, opposite ends of the spectrum, that his is really for private personal data and that ours is for public data. Sure. And that they kind of can work hand in hand for those two aspects of things. So, so the point is, it, it is possible that, uh, that we can reinvent the internet. It, it, it definitely got way off track. It just yeah. got off track. It was supposed to be the great leveler. It ended up being dominated by mainly two humongous monopolies. That's extremely dangerous for democracy as a form of government. It's extremely dangerous in general for human autonomy. Let's reinvent it. And mm -hmm. so, again, I know you're trying to focus on my stuff, but... No, we can talk about this no, as well, I, I, I'm, absolutely, I'm, yeah. I'm saying you're, you're out there on the cutting edge. You're one of those people who's saying, how can we reinvent the internet? And that must be done, it must be done, or in some sense, we will have just given away uh, the free and fair election of the democratic system of government and even human autonomy itself. We will have given it Absolutely. away. Absolutely. The free thinking of to, our children is what really frightens yeah. me. To tech so. executives. <laughs> to tech executives. That's crazy. Who have their own agendas. They're, it, you know. And who are among the most arrogant people on the planet Earth, by the way, because they feel like they know better. And uh, one of the leaks, uh, which is now a year and a half ago, one of the leaks from Google was an eight minute video. It's out there, you can find it. It's called The Selfish Ledger. And it is absolutely frightening because it was never meant to, to go outside of Google. But what it says is we at Google recognize that we have the power to re-engineer humankind. And it specifically mentions according to company values. That's actually in the video. Uh, we need to face this. This is a serious threat. We need to face it and right, right. solve and, this problem. And, and it goes back to what you were talking about with competition because it's okay for companies to have their own values, in my opinion. Sure. They're private companies. They should be able to do what they want. Where we have the friction is that Google is – providing what should be a public service. I like how you talk about how we think of Google like a public library. You know, I love libraries. And um, and how that's so true when we first started learning about Google. It was just this friendly service that helped us all out and finding what we wanted. And now it's become this monster that's controlling well, what well, we think. <laughs> we think of it as a public library where, where everything is free because in the public library, everything is free, right? Mm -hmm. But it turns out that all those free services that Google provides for us are not free at all. We pay for them with our freedom. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yes. Yes, we do. You can find Dr. Epstein on Twitter at Dr. R. Epstein. And for more about his research, go to mygoogleresearch.com. We have more interview episodes in the works for the What Kind of Internet Do You Want series. If there's somebody that you want us to speak with, please give us a shout on Twitter at OpenIndexProto. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.